welcome to Book Rising, a podcast by the Radical Books Collective. Hello everyone, welcome to our podcast, The Book Rising, which rhymes with uprising and we hope to bring you exciting new conversations about books, writers and publishing. My name is Bhakti Sringarpure and I'm your host for today. I will speak with the prolific Sudanese Scottish novelist Leila Abu Leila. She is the author of five novels, two story collections and several radio plays. Leila Abu Leila is beloved not just on the African continent, the United Kingdom and North America, but across the wider Muslim world for her fiction, which often explores the lives of Muslim women, many of whom struggle with migration to the West. She's joining me today from Aberdeen, Scotland, to talk about Nobel laureate Abdul Razak Gurna, about East African and Sudanese literature, and what it means to write fiction for and about Muslim lives. Welcome, Leila. Thank you so much for joining me today for Book Rising. This is the Radical Books Collective podcast, uh, and we have lots and lots to talk about, starting, of course, uh, I don't want to um, you know, even waste any more time, but Abdul Razak Garna's win, um, I, it turns out that you you know him and you know his work, and I just wanted us to you know celebrate that a little bit before we move into talking about what you're working on, what you're doing these days. Um, so let me start with my first question. So the the literature lovers community in the West, US and UK, uh, the Anglophone West, I would say, uh, and on the African continent, uh, there was a lot of rejoicing. Um, with Gurna's win, but there was also a lot of surprise. Um, he's had a quiet and a steady output over the past two decades, but somehow he has not been a kind of bestseller. Um, you, are, you, however, have known about his work, have read, I think, all his novels. Could you describe his work? Well, hi, Bhakti. Thanks for having me on, on your, uh, on your uh, podcast. I am a big fan of Abdul Razak Gurna, so I'm really happy to speak about his work. And I have been reading him um, over the years. He's written 10 novels and I've read, I read eight of the 10 before the novel, before the Nobel uh, announcement. And now I'm in the middle of, of, the, of one of the ones that I haven't um, read and I'm saving paradise for the, the last because and actually that's the one that that um, that is the most popular one and that's the the one that the nobel um, committee uh, mentioned so i think i'm i'm, I'm leaving the the best for the for for, for, for the last <laughs> it's, yeah it's, it, paradise is beautiful there's no doubt <laughs> oh that's great that's yeah. great well he's i mean he's he's um He's such a, 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 his novels are beautiful and they're immersive and uh, very approachable, very easy to, to get into them, to sink into them. Um, um, I, you know, you, you cherish them. He also, uh, once you become a fan, he, he, um, you want to keep reading him because, because he circles around similar themes. You know, he's got certain themes that he circles around and certain areas that he th circles around. So if you love one novel, you will love the next one and you will love the next one and you will love them. He's that kind of, 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 of writer. Um, Zukiswa Warner described um, Gurner's work as being on the quiet side. Um, you know, it doesn't uh, hit you. It doesn't... Um, it it is it tends to be on 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 the quiet side and that might be one of the reason that um you know he uh, he hasn't been you know making uh, making uh, waves mm -hmm. there's um he he's got i think really two kinds of 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 novels he's got the novel which is the about the displacement so he's got the young man usually the young usually young man who comes to england as he did, Gordner himself did in uh, 1967. And, and he goes through the feeling of alienation, the feeling of, um, you know, uh, re encountering racism, encountering um, 
home, not homesickness because he's very much, the characters are very much uh, aware that they've left a place of defeat, a place which is of, of misery and they've come for a better life. So there's always this um, feeling of uh, alienation. And, and then one of the, one of my, actually the, my, my, one of my favorite novels, Admiring Silence, uh, has got a quote that really made a big impression on me. And it says, after all these years, I can't get over the feeling of being alien in England, of being a foreigner. Sometimes I think that what I feel for England is disappointed love. And this disappointed love is kind of infused oh, yeah. through this through these novels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So wow. yeah. Yeah. Uh can I ask you to say a little bit about I think disappointed love is something that is part of your work as well. But <laughs> okay. before we get to with 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 migration, I think. I don't know if it's necessarily uh just England, but we'll get to that. Um this idea of a quiet there's a quietness, I think you said. Um, what does that mean? Do you mean stories that don't immediately grip you or emotional experiences? Um, what, does what does being a quiet writer mean? Well, that's a, that's a good uh, qu uh, question. I mean, there is, it is very emotional. It is very, it's very specific though. I mean, he's specific within this area this this area of of of, of Zanzibar itself so th there is always Zanzibar there is oh, there is um often uh the, the 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 person immigrating from Zanzibar to 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 England um, um so as i said one kind of novel is is the alienation um you know pilgrim's way admiring silent and then um the interracial relationships, but then there's also these historical novels which are set in in the past in 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 in, in Zanzibar, but maybe not overtly. Um, so his concerns are not overtly political, you know. They're not, um, you know, overtly um, political. They, they they are very much to do with the person. I mean, one of the things he does. Uh, a lot is the family secrets. He's very interested in family secrets. So there's something that the family that you feel that this person uh, is ashamed of something, they feel guilty about something. And then we kind of slowly, slowly realize that there is a secret involved and it's a family secret. And it's usually a debt, something to do with money, shame around debt. Uh, it's very, it's embarrassing to even read it actually. Yes, yes, this is it. And the, the thing is that he excels so much in writing about the kind of people who are made small by, by injustice and oppression. So they're not heroes in the sense that they are defiant and they fight back and they, you know, they, they are made small. And we know then when we're reading that actually this is exactly what happens. This is what cruelty and injustice and poverty does, that it crushes people. And he describes this crush you know, of people while at the same time, you know, the, uh, you know, celebrating their humanity and celebrating their sense of resilience. But they are crushed people. They are people who, um, you know, who have experienced humiliation, who are, um, you know, they are made small by, by, by this humiliation and they are unable to, um, uh, they would rather than they've got to the point where they would rather look away rather than uh, confront, uh, you know, or face um, or retaliate. They are, you know, they have been reduced to, to, to that. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you also said, though, that you find humor in some of his work. You had said, said it somewhere. Um, it, so, you know, is that also a kind of self-deprecating humor or is it like, laugh out loud humor how do you look at humor within this these themes yeah there is a sardonic humor that goes around along and it's almost like a reflex that that that, that, that the character um uh, facing uh you know uh, all this uh, racism for example that they are then um f they respond then by making fun of the the the, the racists but also making fun of of uh, of themselves and of other colored people and uh, 
um, so th there is this kind of humor as a way of of of, of defense, you know, like uh, um, like the person is so hurt by the racism and so bitter, but they are going to pretend that they are laughing about it in order to 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 to, to deal to deal with it. Yeah. Wow. And uh, just a final question on Gurna, and we can move on. Are you able to describe as a writer? Uh, at the level of craft, if what he brings at the level of form or craft, you know? Um, well, there is very much the, 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 the storytelling. And I think that this is something that, that, that maybe appealed to, 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 to the Nobel Prize because um, there, we've always been hearing about how African literature is big on, on storytelling. So th th there is this person narrating a story and, 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 and keeping us uh, interested and, and, and uh, you know, uh, revealing little by little, little by little, little, little by little. There is this kind of uh, seduction going on that we are given uh, uh, drips and drabs. Um, there's wonderful, you know, uh, descriptions of the place, Zanzibar, the, the people. He's so good at, he's very good at describing women as well, the, you know, really uh, African Muslim women. They do come across very vividly in his, in his uh, writing. Um, the dialogue is also very, very of a very high standard. The dialogue is really Im impeccable. Um, so there's a, there's a lot, I mean, the, the whole, the writing is really from beginning to end. It's, it's, it's kind of like perfect. There is no, you're not, you're not reading and saying, oh, this is weak. This is no, no, it's all very, um, you know, it, it's all very such of a, of a, such of a high standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to shift our conversation just a little bit, though I do want to come back to the idea of writing Muslim lives and what is the impact of that and um, what are the repercussions sometimes from the book publishing industry of, of, of those themes. Um, but, you know, um, my, my, uh, you know, at Radical Books Collective, Meg Orenberg, who works with me, uh, she, she focuses on Tanzanian literature. She's a very talented translator from Swahili. Uh, and then I was living in Kenya and I, I work a lot on as a, as a scholar or literary critic on East African literature, though it's primarily Somalia or Sudan. And it was, it was exciting to think that Gurna's win uh, suddenly made us think about uh, East Africa or the Horn of Africa. Uh, and, you know, suddenly the world kind of looked away from the typical South Africa, Nigeria, Senegal focus to this other part of the continent. And one interesting that does is that it forces us academics, readers, book lovers, whomever, uh, to think about African literature outside of a giant continental framework, because it's, it's never been appropriate to fit 50 plus countries in one box, right? Um, so do you think that there is such a thing as East African literature, something that brings these many, many countries together? Can we, can we promote this category? Yes, it's always always good to to promote this part of the world, which is less, which part of Africa, which is getting less, gets less attention than West Africa and, uh, as you said, South Africa, and also, of course, the North has its own specific the Maghreb literature. They have their own, um, you know, the, the 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 own literature, whether it's the Francophone or whether it's the you know the Arab literature of of uh, Egypt and and Libya and and, and so on. Um, I think maybe what what uh, what characterizes the the the, the, the Eastern African I, I, it's very difficult to generalize, but perhaps there is more of a of of, of a mixing in in terms of of the cultural mix. I mean, he himself, Gurner, the Zanzibar, he describes. Uh, you feel the, uh, you know, you've got the Africans, you've got the Omanis, you've got the Indian uh, shopkeepers, you've got the sailors, you have, you know, so that, that you feel then that you are in a, in, a, in a place which has a mix of cultures and a mix of ethnicities. 
um, and people are, are moving, are so close to China, they're close to India, they're close to the Oman, the, the Arabian Peninsula, um, and, and, and there is a kind of a mix. They're so close to the, to the Red Sea, which you don't get that in, 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 in the West African novel, which, 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 is, which is, uh, seems to be very um, more African, I don't know, in a way, I mean, or more um, like Chinua Achebe seems to be almost um, cut off from the rest of 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 uh, of, of the world. It, things for a part, <laughs> yeah. you know. That there isn't there isn't a flow of ethnicities or a flow of, of of trade going 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 around. But I mean, these are just kind of like generalizations, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I see. So uh, East Africa allows access to like a further east is what what you're saying uh, yes. in a way and i think west african literature what tends to happen is uh, they also tend to engage perhaps more than east africans with the history of uh, transatlantic slavery yes. and things like that so that's interesting but of course then there's, there's the omanis and that version of slavery and we get those very left out narratives uh, in east african uh, writing uh, that said uh, you were uh, born in Khartoum uh, in Sudan and you grew up there before you moved to Scotland. Um, and I think your work is a confluence of very different influences than potentially Gurnas or Gugiwa Thiongos. Um, and I think that is the kind of uh, North Africa that you already mentioned, Egypt in particular. And Sudanese literature uh, tends to be less in English and more in Arabic, uh, and is deeply influenced, I think, in the end by forms coming out of Egypt, Mahfouz, uh, you know, many uh, writers from there. So, you know, then we have the problem of trying to fit Sudanese literature into East Africa. Um, you know, does it even fit? What, what, how do you, what, you know, how can we think of Sudanese literature uh, as African literature, as East African literature, what is unique about it? Uh, what what is uh, you know, in what ways is is there is it very African at the end of the day? Um, okay, I'll get I'll get to that. But I wanted just to say <laughs> about the 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 the, gur, the, the different the Gurna, um my writing and, and Gurna, There's a, there's a twenty year gap between um, Abdul Razak Gurna and myself in the sense that he came to Britain in, in 67 and I came in 87 and he's writing about you know Britain in the 70s and I'm writing about Britain in the 90s so there is a there's you can see a kind of a time uh, a 20-year a, a, a um, gap between the two and the differences in terms of um, what Brit what Britain was uh, is, is is like to to to, to Africans uh, coming uh, in um, the, the thing about Sudan, uh, Sudanese literature, because it is it is Arabic. I mean, when you say Sudanese literature, it is predominantly Arabic. It just happened that that uh, in my case, because I made this uh, move to 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 the UK, that I'm writing in uh, the, in writing in uh, English, but um, Sudanese literature is. Arabic literature and so of course the influence is 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 very much um uh Arab Arab literature and I it's I mean when we talk about um classifying literature it's, it's it's a good question to ask is who are these writers reading you know who who are they reading at the end of the day are they reading are Sudanese um writers reading other African writers or are they reading uh, Arab uh, write, writers. Um, so um, they are mostly reading Arab uh, writers in, in, in Sudan uh, and they are reading, but, but at the same time, there's a lot of translation going on. So the, 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 the English Arabic translation is actually very vibrant. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Sudan and I spoke to young people, for example, who are you reading? They'll say, oh, we're reading Elif Shafak 
or we're reading Khaled Husseini. So all these bestsellers that are, especially with the Muslim interests that, that, that are in the West, they are reaching, um, you know, the, the, they, they do reach the Arab reader and they do reach the, 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 the Sudanese uh, reader. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to see more uh, African uh, novels being uh, translated into Arabic. This is, you know, this is new. This is coming up now. I know Adichie's novel has been translated into Arabic. Um, just now, Lola Shinoyan's uh, wow. Sego, Sego, Sego's Wives. Sego's Wives was, was launched at, in the Sharjah Book uh, Festival. So this is nice. This is nice to, to see this happening. And it, it should it should be happening. And it should, once it takes off, I don't see uh, any obstacles because um, there are so many translators available and there are so many, um, uh, you know, um, but publishers happy to publish translated work. The other way around is maybe not the same. Uh, the, the, the Arabic, the number of Arabic novels, including then Sudanese novels, translated into English. That that is not so widespread as it as it uh, as it should be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and your not... own work is available in Arabic. Yes, all of it is available in, in Arabic now. Yeah, yeah. And is that this is something it. because you have? you and your agents and so on have pushed for this or it did naturally kind of happened? No, I personally pushed for it because I wanted, of course, to reach the Sudanese reader. And I knew that, that uh, I'm only reaching a certain kind of Sudanese reader, you know, the ones who are reading English, whether they are uh, uh, in, in Europe or the States or in the, in, in the Gulf, um, uh, you know, areas. So uh, me being translated into Arabic then makes it makes me reach a wider um, Sudanese uh, readership. Right. Can you uh, um, can you name a few Sudanese writers that Sudanese readers are reading? For example, Abdel Abdelaziz Barakasakin. He's he's a huge bestseller in uh, in, in 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 Sudan. And yet, um, I've been trying to help him um, uh, get his uh, his novels published in the UK, and uh, it's not straightforward. It's not straightforward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 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 so, different. Uh, so he's one. And then, do you think that there is, uh, you know, in in the Western academia and uh, you know book circles, Tayeb Salah is a big. Uh, it, it still remains. Uh, someone very important. Uh, are Sudanese readers now reading reading him in the bookstores in Khartoum, for example? Would we yeah. find Salah? He's huge. He's huge in Sudan. He continues to be. He's even more. His reputation has soared after his death. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Why is that? I don't know. There's so many prizes now named after him. And, um, you know, his, um, his, his, his left really a good legacy. There's a lot of love, love for him. He's really a beloved, a, a beloved writer. And Season of Migration, I mean, I read it recently. It is just, it's just incredible. It is, it's, a, it's an amazing, I mean, that is explosive. The violence, the, 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 the shock, that is, yeah. <laughs> that is very much on the other side spectrum from from Abdul Razak Gurner in terms of the impact it, it hits the the, the, the the reader reader with. Um, but you but you, the thing with with Tayyip Saleh is that he was living in, in the UK. Uh, you know he was his wife was English. He's very Anglophone, even though he wrote in Arabic. I mean he wrote his novel was written in Arabic. But it was translated almost simultaneously by Dennis Johnson Davis, who was his, his right. friend. So there was no gap between its uh, its publication Arabic. The gap was very small between its uh, applica- uh, publication Arabic and its publication in in, in English, and mm-hmm. it kind of like soared both in both languages. But he's very um, you can even tell with the the subject matter of season and the. Um, you know the inter- intertextuality in it that he was such a big reader of um, of of in, in English in an English language. So um, the the other generations of uh, of Sudanese writers didn't have this education and the opportunities that Saleh had. 
Mm -hmm. uh so they are more closer to the to the arabic uh you know style of novels arabic kind of of uh, of of no novels i mean hamur ziada for example he's another sudanese author who's also very huge very very popular in 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 sudan and he won um the american um University Press Prize, right? The Cairo one, the, right? The, the Najib Mahfouz Prize. Yeah, he 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 won that prize, and so he's a big big success in um, you know in the in in the Arab uh, world. Um, um, but yet he hasn't yet reached the the, the, right. the English translation hasn't really made an impact and hasn't really reached uh, African uh, readers uh, either. Yeah. I see. I see. I see. Yeah, that's an interesting interplay, uh, linguistically and regionally. And I think there's a lot like yet left to be desired in terms of how these circuits um, work. You know, and of course, I'm thinking of uh, because I, I I worked with so many of them, uh, writers from South Sudan who are writing in um, yeah. English as well. And I don't know how that plays out. Um, but you know. Um, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I think translation becomes at the end of the day the most crucial kind of thing. What about women writers, Sudanese women writers? I, I'm familiar with Stella Gaetano, who has, who again has this kind of South Sudan, Sudan. She's at the kind of uh, interplay of the two places. Um, I'm trying to think of other uh, women writers. I know there are so many. Yeah, the uh, Stella Stella Gaetano is almost like an Im mirror image of myself. That she's she's African South Sudanese, but she writes in Arabic. Uh -huh. So um, she <laughs> also get <laughs> she you know what her books the way it, her books were received in the north you know where where it kind of reminded me of how I get sometimes asked questions here in 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 the UK. It was interesting in that in that way. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big fan of her work. There is Anna Safi. There is um, some of the older writers, Zainab Bilal, um, uh, Buthayna Makki. Mm -hmm. um, again, they haven't really been translated uh, wi widely, and uh, mm -hmm. um, they they just they don't have. Um, they haven't been getting the editorial support, you know, the, 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 the workshops, the, 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 the there's, the, there's a lot that, that can, that can be done. There's not, and, and it's, it's caused by Sudan being under sanctions, you know, that, that, uh, that that's also affects the literary uh, field. And um, so once, hopefully once these sanctions are lifted, then mm -hmm. things could, could get better. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I didn't want to, time stamp our uh, yes. podcast too much but uh, the situation in, in in Sudan right now is is fairly despairing actually and uh, very and, despairing very yeah. despairing especially when it was getting better and we were you know the the, the sanctions were getting lifted the the and all, all that yeah 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 no, you're yeah. right yeah and mm -hmm. of course I mean I I like that you uh, you you spoke about the ways in which political crises are often the mediators of the way literature comes and goes from different places. Uh, there used to be uh, this, uh, it was almost a joke, but it was true. But it's like uh, when there's war and the displaced people come, like the cuisine choices become better <laughs> in, in the United States or the UK. And it sounds so facile and cheap to say that, but it's sort of true. But it's historically been that way for literature, you know, uh, as soon as there's a political crisis, there's a whole kind of literary marketplace shift also that occurs, translation that occurs. Uh, and I think that's interesting to think about, of course, with Sudan and um, South Sudan as well in this case. Um, mm. I want to I wanna ask you about something else that um, when I was, uh, you know, asking you to do this podcast and it sort of came up, which is, uh, which is about the idea of writing Muslim lives, uh, writing Muslim culture uh, in literature, uh, and particularly in English. So certainly we would say Gurna does this. Uh, and I would say you are probably an even bigger name than Gurna in, in, in terms of uh, narrating a kind of a certain type of lived Islamic experience. 
particularly uh, with women. Uh, and you have a massive readership and popularity uh, within the Muslim diaspora. And uh, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't help but wonder uh, how this has impacted the reception of your work in an Islamophobic West, uh, which is where you publish your books. Uh, has it been a challenge? Is it, um, is it a harder thing to convince uh, publishers uh, to, to, uh, to engage certain themes, topics, certain characters? Are you asked for all kinds of edits? And uh, I, you know, we also kind of hinted at the idea that Gurna's work is a bit under the radar because it is so culturally Muslim in a way. Um, and, and there is a kind of alienation and prejudice around these topics in the UK, in the US. Yeah, I mean, when we start off by saying that, you know, the literature in English is Eurocentric, it's also then Christian centric. And so it becomes it becomes then doubly um, uh, harder to 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 reach out for the you know the Muslim uh, uh, writers and Muslim uh, readership, and um, but I'm not sure that 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 publishers themselves they they hardly know enough about Africa anyway for them to <laughs> to really you know. Um, be troubled by that so i wouldn't i wouldn't really say that um um it was it's a challenge coming in from a muslim uh, per, 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 per perspective um i think that it's 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 getting better in a way that the readership i mean it's because because there's the demand and supply so as the number of muslim readers increase in the diaspora muslim english readers increase and as they uh, become uh, financially uh, better off i mean i remember i remember when i when i first arrived and, and probably when when gunnar even of course it was even worse when gunnar arrived in the 60s and the 70s I mean, the the Muslims who were 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 the Muslim immigrants working, you know, in uh, in factories. You know, they're not very educated. They don't speak English. They they're not going to go and buy a hardback book for for thirteen fourteen pounds. They never get. They're never going to do that. You know, and 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 even when I when when I came in 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 the eighties and the nineties. And uh, the kind of, of 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 let's say that the Muslim immigrant or the Muslim uh, re refugee seeker was uh, um, a student, let's say at that at that, le at that level, they would buy books for their children, but they weren't buying books for themselves. So now, as the years have gone by, and as these children have grown up, and as these children are, you know, this all these my readers who are in their thirties, let's say, young uh, women, Muslim women in their thirties. Uh, educated they've lived most of their life in the UK they have money to spare on on to buy to buy to buy fiction and so <laughs> that is uh, you know I, I I see that as what is keeping me alive not keeping me alive but keeping me published <laughs> <laughs> that I'm being supported <laughs> yes I'm supported by a growing demographic mm -hmm. and so this then makes my my sales figure look decent even mm -hmm. though you know that the average no, it's uh, more than decent Let's say. <laughs> middle middle england is not you know is not embracing me uh whatever uh but but then because maybe they feel more comfortable with uh you know the the typical west african um kind of novel or, or mm -hmm. so on but uh, so that is what is happening these demographic changes that changes the readership and then makes it easier for for then Muslim writers to to present the 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 work and to um, and I think that that's happening with all of African uh, literature. Uh, you know that the, there is that the, it's the growing demographic that uh, um, mm -hmm. that um, that brings in the, the readership. I remember back in um, oh I don't remember was it two thousand and seven or something like that. I attended an event where Petina Gappa was reading. It was her first novel, and then we were, you know, it was usual the the you know the few few attendees, and then suddenly suddenly there was a whole wave of Zimbabweans uh, came into the into the hall, and you know, and and, and it was just amazing, and and that they had all come for her <laughs> to support her, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was a new thing, you know, that that was in London. And that was, uh, I felt that that was like a, a new page in, in, in the history of literature that, that suddenly, um, you know, uh, Africans themselves were attending events and that they, they were supporting their own writers. Whereas before, um, uh, African writers were writing for a white readership to mm-hmm. some extent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the idea of the way in which the diaspora lifts the lifts yes. the writer. I remember uh, years ago when Nadifa Muhammad wrote her first novel, The Black Mamba Boy, and it came out in the US, but it, you know, she was relatively unknown. And at the time I had, I was running Warscapes. And through that, we organized a bunch of events for her uh, at the Brooklyn Book Festival and in some stores and things like that. And uh and the bookstore that I had organized one of these events, um, along with a couple of other writers, they didn't really buy many copies of her of her book. Okay. They only kept a few available. They just assumed that it's this is not the book that's going to sell out of the people that were invited. But the Somali diaspora had bought it out and it became like a crisis. Like, where are we getting the books? Where are we getting the books? And uh, it was, of course, before the days when Amazon delivered books to you like Chinese food, you know. But <laughs> so uh, that, that you know, it reminds me of what you're saying with the Zimbabweans showing up. Um, but there's readership. And I think you have a huge readership. Uh, but then there is this other world of the literary marketplace, which is prizes, uh, which is reviews, uh, which is like academic writing, uh, course assignments and things like that. Um, And I, uh, you know, I I would say there is some resistance in that, that, that part. Uh, when it comes to Gurna, when it comes to your work. Um, I don't know if you disagree. Uh, You know, for example, in the in the US, one doesn't know Gurna, but in every UK bookstore, you can always buy at least one of his books. In Kenya, you can buy at least one of his books. In South Africa, you can easily buy his books. So the issue with Gurna and readership is only only American, right? Um, but I think uh, the the there's that secondary thing. There is the idea of the of the prizes, the reviews, validation the agent representations, all of those other things. And I do wonder if Muslim literature has had its day in that, in that sun. You see what I mean? Yeah. No, no, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's still to come. Um, I think, as, as you mentioned, the, the, the United States has um, invested a lot in, in, in interest in the transatlantic um, slavery so anything that comes from that side and and the books that deal with this do you know find um uh, success and understanding in, in yeah rather than than from 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 that side um i think again it is an issue of dem- demographic i mean i get a lot of students i have a lot of students from uh, from egypt from algeria lots of lots of students working on my work for mm-hmm. um um, PhDs for postgraduate work, for even for undergraduate work within Algerian universities, within Egyptian universities, India as well, Pakistan. Yes. So a lot of these students are are feeling comfortable with this work and happy to write about it. So um, that then also will. Uh, I don't know. Then once they reach the the, the West, uh, what what happens? I mean. Uh, uh, Gurna himself, he supervised a PhD thesis by um, a young woman uh, from Saudi Arabia about my my work, amongst wow. other <laughs> writers. Yeah, so that was <laughs> that's yeah. a nice uh, co- connection. So mm-hmm. um, so you can see this, for example, a young uh, Saudi Arabian woman wanting to work on on Muslim topics. Um, she's lucky she found Gurner at the University of Kent, but you know, if she had been somewhere else, she might have not have found uh, a sympathetic uh, super supervisor. So it's 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 still uh, pushing its way slowly, uh, slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, but hopefully, we will get there. Yeah, <laughs> you should prevail. Yes, let's you hope. Prevail, yeah. <laughs> I think I mean, the, there was the a- Nobel is a big step in a way, almost. There's something in that, even though that's not what they were celebrating. They were celebrating uh, his uh, the, the migration, 
giving voice to the challenges of migration. And your work also gives voice to the challenges of, of migration through, I think, uh, a women's perspective. Um, but I think it, it uh, you know, it, it's as an, an, in this, in, there's a side theme, which is the Islamic uh, yeah. cultural life, you know, which Gurna does promote. Do you think that um, some of the reception of your work or the readership of your work um, was driven by post 9-11, post 9-11, you know, like the way in which Muslims were targeted or uh, that's like the violence side, but also this attempt to understand the Islamic world, that that it gave particular impetus to your uh, books? I think that this is particularly true for Minaret, which uh, even though it was my second novel, it was published first in the United States. So it was my debut in in the US when it was uh, published. Mm -hmm. And um, it got a lot of attention. Um, They they sold 18,000 copies, um, you know, almost immediately. So that was then when it came out 2006, that was, uh, uh, you know, fueled by by that. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, of course, the, the... uh, there were other books in the marketplace along that theme. The what was it? Um, Khaled Hosseini, the, yes. the, the kite, kite runner, runner, that became a bestseller. You know, as you said, as they're bombing Afghanistan, they want they want to read about the, the kite <laughs> runner, and um, yeah, the reluctant fundamentalist by Mohsen Hamid. Um, right. And then at that time, also when the Nobel ch- decided to choose a Muslim writer, they went for Orhan Pamuk. Ah, yes, okay. They I didn't went make for that connection before. Yeah, they went for Orhan uh, Pamuk at that who at that time represented the kind of secular Muslim, and uh, he said in interviews, you know, I I don't know anything about Islam. All I know is that my <laughs> nanny used to take me to the mosque. So, <laughs> <laughs> that so was such it. a the most Turkish response I've ever heard. <laughs> it's a bourgeois <laughs> Turkish response. Okay, that's interesting. So that was was going on at the time when Minaret was was published, and so mm-hmm. in in the middle of all this, um, mm-hmm. you know, Minaret w- presented this kind of alternative, um, uh, uh, you know, um, view of 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 the Muslim uh, women. But that was just a that was a blip in time. But I, I kind of like kept going. Um, yes. I, I, and, and I think that that, uh, mm-hmm. uh, that same interest didn't continue. Uh, and, and, and instead, it was more, as I said, with the new, uh, with actual Muslims themselves buying the books and the new kind of generation of, 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 of Muslims right. buying the books. But there's also a lot of readership who appreciate a religious point of view. You know, I'm just... I just got an invitation now to speak to uh, McGill University, their divinity, divinity students uh-huh. uh, who have responded very well to, 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 to Minaret, to the religious uh, themes in, 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 in the Minaret. So there, is, there, has been, there has been this kind of, I find that particularly rewarding and there has been this kind of, um, this interest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I mean, Yes, I think I see what you're saying about the U.S. and the reception in the U.S. of Minaret. Uh, But you have kind of attempted to push the U.K. as well to think about it. I mean, I would say um, that, you know, if we think about your 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 novels, they have successively become uh, more political. And I guess I'm thinking of the kindness of enemies, Mm. uh, which is about Imam Shamil and about the concept of jihad and to kind of offer a correction to those yes. uh, to those ideas and in that there is a character that is explicitly being targeted by the UK a young man um and you know so you kind of go back and forth in time so you're implicating the united kingdom in their war of terror yes. activities <laughs> yeah. um very much as well would you say uh, yeah, that one was the most, um, you know, uh, directly kind of political of my novel. It was also the one that, that I was disappointed, the re- reception disappointed me. I really had quite high hopes for it. And mm-hmm. I was I was kind of disappointed afterwards uh, from it. Mm-hmm. But and then the after I was disappointed, um, 
it freed me to write what I wanted in a way. I, I then wrote Bird Summons, which was very uh, just different and the magic realism. And, and I kind mm-hmm. of went, you know, into like, um, well, I'm going to write what I like, sort of. <laughs> Not that the <laughs> kindness of enemies wasn't what I liked it, but in a way, um, I almost, I, it was, it was my most, I was mostly, I was very disappointed by the reception. It, it, it disappointed me more than, than my other novels, I would say. Yeah. yeah. But you're, you're saying something that upsets me as a person who studies literature and who doesn't write it, uh, is that the reception alters your next project. Yeah, but it altered it in a good way. It altered it in the sense that it freed me from uh, from uh, it kind of made me f- free from the the the, est- the establishment in a way. I mean, I tried. I, I was almost like I was saying, "Well, I, I gave you my best. You, mm-hmm. you you didn't. You rejected it, and um, and so I'm gonna just do do my own thing uh, now." Yeah, right, and right. the kindness of enemies was actually when you were talking about the Booker. It was called in by the judges, so it was. Uh, it was one of the novels that they. Um, so this, what happens with these with these with the Booker is that the the publisher presents submits prizes, mm-hmm. and then a, a certain number of book they're allowed to submit a certain number of book, and then they they write letters about other books. Okay. And 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 these letters, the the judges then have the 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 right. To, to call in this book. I see. So it got called in. So it got called in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but then it didn't, it didn't uh, make it into the long list even. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I, yeah. It's, it's, I think, one of my absolute, absolute favorite uh, novels. <laughs> so, I, you know, that, that surprises me. I think, I think it's like one thing to grapple with Africa or Sudan and then a yet other thing to grapple with Dagestan and Chechnya and people are, can be just so fixated on what they know, you know, to know more, but only on what they know. It's a beautiful novel uh, just because uh, you're so skilled at uh, not just writing history, but kind of offering a sense of place. And mm. that's very hard to do in uh, 19th century work you know that you feel you're transported in that moment in that in that time I mean that's a a very specific skill so I'm glad you wrote it and let's hope you know it could have a revival I mean look at uh, look at Gurna yes it does no it got good (laughs) reviews I mean all the reviews were very good uh so it was just uh, that that that, I don't know what I don't know what happened but um it just mm-hmm. it, it it but I remember just feeling this sense of freedom that I can you know that's it I don't uh, mm-hmm. you know I don't need to I could do do what I like I'm sort of out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's so great. That good. <laughs> that's great. Uh, what are you working on uh, now? Are you? So able I'm to working. Us? Yes, I'm working on. Uh, a uh, historical uh, novel set in Sudan. This one is, is set entirely in Sudan in the 19th century, and it's about the uh, the 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 years uh, and the revolution that led to the British in, invasion. So um, it's it follows uh, the, um, you know the lives of different characters, Sudanese uh, and, um, and and British, but mainly uh, Sudanese. It's it's quite a well known story. The the at least this in in the UK the Gordon the Gordon of uh, Khartoum is quite a well known um, Victorian tragic hero. There are statues of him. He's got lots of statues on the embankment and here in Aberdeen. You know he's uh, he's a figure. He represents to the British um, all that is good about the empire. And um, so to to kind of take him on and decolonize him and <laughs> <laughs> so so we so once we have the book we're going to have to dismantle some your fans will have to dismantle some statues of, yes. of, of Gordon I've never <laughs> I've never heard of him I don't know who who is he 
He's, um, he's a general, army general? He was an army general. He was an army general who, who was killed by the, by the Sudanese uh, in, in Khartoum uh, when a siege took place. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the Sudanese were rebelling against the, the Ottoman Empire. And he was, uh, he was working for the Ottoman uh, Empire. And so there was a siege of, of Khartoum and he, he dug in and he refused to you know, compromise, he refused to surrender. And so they, uh, he, was, he was beheaded by the, 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 the Sudanese. Mm-hmm. And because of that, there was this whole um, um, cult of, you know, Gordon is a martyr and, and you know, we, want, we have to avenge Gordon's death. We, we have to, you know, put things right in Sudan. It's just the way they put it, but really they wanted to avenge him. And so this resulted in 14 years later after his death, where they, they went and they conquered Sudan officially, and they, it became then part of the, the British uh, M- Empire. Mm-hmm. So wow. that's, <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to read that. That sounds incredible. <laughs> um, so I think I will uh, let you go, though we could talk about so many other things. Thank you so much for joining us on Book Rising today. Thank you, Bhakti.